This video is sponsored by KiwiCo, but more on that later. The Earth has a mass of about six septillion kilograms. That's six trillion trillion kilograms, or a six with 24 zeros after it. That's a pretty mind-blowing fact by itself, but to me what's even cooler is that we as humans even managed to figure that out in the first place, because it's not like we can just take an entire planet and put it on a set of scales. So how did we actually go about measuring the weight of the world? So there's a few ways that we can go about calculating the mass of the Earth. I'm gonna focus on two today. One of those is just from some simple geometry and the other one is by using gravity. Now if we start with the first one, just with some simple geometry, if we assume the Earth is a perfect sphere, which is not quite true, it's actually an oblate spheroid, which is essentially a squashed sphere. It bulges at the equator slightly because it's spinning faster there, but let's not make the math any more complicated than it has to be. What, like it's hard? Now, if we remember back to high school geometry, if the Earth is a perfect sphere, then it has a volume V equal to four thirds pi radius of the Earth cubed. So the radius of the Earth is the length from the center to the edge of the Earth. Then we can get at the mass of the Earth if we know the Earth's density. The mass of the Earth is then just the density of Earth times by that volume. So the mass of the Earth is the density of Earth times four thirds pi radius of the Earth cubed. Simple, right? Except that we don't know the density of Earth and we don't know the radius of the Earth either. So let's think of another way that we can do this. The second way is with gravity. So in the late 1600s, Isaac Newton published his equations that he'd come up with to describe the force between two objects due to gravity. So he said this force was equal to the strength of gravity overall times by the mass of one object times by the mass of the other object, all divided by the distance apart the two objects are squared. So we could use that equation to work out the force between you and the Earth right now. The mass of one object would be the Earth, the mass of the other object would be your mass, and then the distance between them would be the radius of the Earth. Of course, we then need to know the force that you're feeling because of the Earth, and the force that you feel is the force of gravity, so when you jump up, it's the force that brings you back down again. And as Isaac Newton also told us, the force is equal to your mass times by your acceleration, and your acceleration is the strength of Earth's gravity that we write little g. So these two forces are the same, and what we get is your mass times by the strength of Earth's gravity is equal to the strength of gravity overall, the Earth's mass, your mass, and the radius of Earth squared. We can simplify this equation, your mass turns up on both sides, so we can cross that out, and we can rearrange it for the mass of the Earth, which is equal to the strength of Earth's gravity, the radius of the Earth squared divided by the strength of gravity overall. But again, we're kind of in the same predicament as we were before because we don't know the radius of the Earth, we don't know the strength of gravity overall, and we don't know the acceleration due to Earth's gravity either. So that's three things that we need to know to work out the mass of the Earth, and at least that's not the seven things we needed to know to work out how long the sun had left to live last time. If you haven't checked out that video yet, I will link it up here somewhere. But if we compare our first way of calculating the mass of the Earth with geometry and our second way with gravity, then we realize that we really cannot escape knowing the radius of the Earth before we can calculate the mass of the Earth. And so if we're gonna know how massive the Earth is, we first need to know how big is the Earth. So the very first person to try and measure the size of the Earth that we know of anyway, was Eratosthenes in about 200 BC. Now any of the writings that Eratosthenes made about his measurement have all unfortunately been lost to time. But historians do have records from a Greek astronomer called Cleomedes who actually wrote a simplified version for the public. He said, if you picture two cities directly sort of north-south from each other, then you can measure the sun makes with the ground using the shadow cast by essentially a big stick. 
So the difference in the angle that the sun casts on those two sticks in the two different cities gives you how far around the circle you are. So if there's a seven degrees difference in the angle, the, the shadow of the sticks, then you're seven of 360 degrees around the Earth's circumference. So if you know the distance between those two cities, then you can work out the entire circumference of the Earth just by equating those two ratios of seven over 360 degrees and however many miles the cities are separated by, divided by the circumference of the Earth. The circumference of the Earth is then just two pi times the radius of Earth. Remember, high school geometry again. And so if you can measure the circumference, you can measure the radius. Curtis Boat actually has a great video recreating this experiment and actually cycling about 250 kilometers further than Earth than his mate that's also measuring the angle of the sticks. I'll link it in the video description for you below. Now, Aristosthenes' eventual measurement for the circumference of the Earth was 252,000 stadia, which is about 39,000 kilometers, which is only about 1% less than sort of the modern day value that we use for the circumference of the Earth. So it was pretty good going, and he managed to do that in 200 BC. Now, as I said, Earth is not a perfect sphere. It bulges at the equator slightly. And so these measurements of the circumference and the radius that you measure are going to be ever so slightly different depending on where you are on the Earth's surface. Because at the equator, the Earth is actually 42 kilometers wider than it is at the poles. And we know that now thanks to the work of Gladys West through the 70s and 80s. She worked with data from satellites that gave her the altitude of the satellite above the Earth's surface so that she could completely map the Earth's shape. She then came up with this oblate spheroid model, which she actually um, programmed an IBM computer to model as well. And all of her work essentially formed the basis for the Global Positioning Service, GPS, that we all use today. And so because of that, we now know that the radius of the Earth, at least at the equator, is 6,378 kilometers or 3,963 miles. Okay, so that's one unknown down, but we still have these other two unknowns. Let's start with little g, the acceleration due to Earth's gravity. We essentially need to work out how fast something will fall to Earth. And again, thanks to Newton's laws of gravity, we can derive an equation that will let us work out what that acceleration would be so that we have an acceleration g that is equal to two times the height that something is dropped from divided by the time it takes to fall squared. Now we can actually all do this experiment from home if we just drop an object from a known height and then we time how long it takes to fall. It's not the best and most accurate way of doing things because the height could vary and then we've got human reaction times with the stopwatch. But you can do this with your slow-mo camera on your smartphone, a piece of paper and a pencil. Or in my case, I apparently don't have a pencil anywhere in the house, but I did have a snazzy pastel pink highlighter. So the reason we use a piece of paper is because it's a standard, right? This is an A4 piece of paper. I know exactly that it's 297 millimeters long and I can double check that as well. And what I've done is I folded it in half to make sort of like a little tower for it. And then I'm gonna balance my pencil and my highlighter on top like that. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my slow-mo camera and I'm gonna record myself essentially karate chopping the paper so I can move it out of the way without disturbing the pencil or the highlighter on top. And the slow-mo will record at which exact frame it started to drop and which exact frame it hit the desk. I don't have a second tripod for this, so I'm just gonna hold it like a little selfie slow-mo. Let's go. That was too much fun. <laughs> so we can see if we play that video back that it takes about 30 frames for the highlighter to fall from the top of the piece of paper to the desk. Now my phone says that it records at 120 frames per second, which means that it took the highlighter about 0.25 seconds or a quarter of a second to fall from the height of the paper of about 0.297 meters. So we plug all those numbers in, then we find that G 
equals 2 times 0 0.297 divided by 0.25 squared, which equals 9.5 meters per second squared. So the accepted like modern value of the acceleration due to Earth's gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. So it's pretty cool that we can get that close and that accurate, you know, just with our smartphone and a piece of paper at our desks. You obviously can do it much more accurately in the lab if you use like laser light gates to record the exact moment that something fell past a specific location. And of course, if you have a camera with a much higher frame per second rate as well, maybe I should have like called the slow-mo guys to collaborate for this little tiny bit of the video. Obviously back in the day, this is not how the acceleration due to Earth's gravity was measured. You know, people would drop things off very tall buildings, the height of which was known very well and, and time how long it took them to fall. This is what Galileo Galilei is famous for, you know, dropping things off the Leaning Tower of Pisa to test gravity. Of course, their experiments were nowhere near as accurate because they didn't have very accurate timing devices. You know, smartphones not invented in Galileo's day. How he worked under those conditions, I'll never know. So now we have the radius of the Earth and we have the acceleration due to Earth's gravity, but we still need to know the overall strength of gravity in the entire universe. So I bet you're sat there thinking, well, how in the universe do you go about measuring something like that? Well, essentially what you're trying to measure is how much two objects will attract each other. And so the very first person to try and do this was Henry Cavendish at the end of the 1790s. So what Cavendish did was he took two balls or two masses and put them at opposite ends of a very rigid rod. He then suspended that from the ceiling so that it was sort of isolated from Earth's gravity and that meant that it could also spin freely around however it liked. If you left it long enough it would just be still because there'd be no movements of air causing it to move or anything like that. Then he got two bigger masses and put them in the same room and the idea was that the smaller masses would be attracted to the bigger masses and that rod would spin. Now to make the rod spin, you need torque, just like torque on a steering wheel. So if you can measure the torque on the rod from knowing the angle that it moves as it's attracted to those bigger masses, then you know the force that's pulling that rod. That force is the force of gravity, and therefore you can work out how strong the force of gravity is. So the force the masses feel times by the length of the rod is equal to the torsion coefficient of the rod, which is how resistant it is to twisting, times by the angle that the rod moves. This force is equal to Newton's force that we had before, the strength of gravity times by the big mass mass, the small mass mass, divided by how far apart those two masses are squared. Putting all those formulas together and doing a lot of algebra to rearrange gives you a nice formula to work out the strength of gravity across the whole universe. Now, although Cavendish did measure this strength of gravity, big G, with this experiment, he never actually wrote that term in any of his equations. Instead, he expressed it as another equation that gave him the density of Earth instead, which is what he was interested in measuring to use the geometric way of working out the mass of the Earth instead. He found an average density of the Earth of 5.48 grams per centimeter cubed. That's about five times less dense than water, which we can now convert to a value of G of 6.74 times 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared, which is actually only 1% different from the modern value that we measure in the lab today, which is 6.67408 times 10 to the minus 11 meters squared per kilogram per second squared. Well, that's a mouthful. That most accurate measurement of G was done using the exact same setup as Cavendish. It was done back in August 2018 by a Chinese research team. But also there's lots of other ways of doing it too, which is very important. We have to get independent ways of measuring G just to check that there's, you know, no inconsistencies. And you can do that now with things like laser-cooled atoms as well, which give you a very similar result if one that's not quite as accurate. So now we have all those numbers, it's just a case of plugging them into that equation we had before, so that the mass of the Earth is 9.8 times by 6,378 kilometers, and it needs to be in meters, so let's times that by a thousand. 
and square it. And then we divide all of that by 6.67408 times 10 to the minus 11, and we get a number for the mass of the Earth of 5.95 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, or approximately 6 trillion trillion kilograms. So there you have it. It was a fairly simple bit of maths by the end of it, you know, to calculate the answer to a fairly uh, heavy problem of what is the mass of the Earth. But it was only possible because of the huge amount of science that's gone on in the past 2,000 years of history. I think what, if anything, it's just a really stark reminder that all of science and all of research that's done today in 2020 is done standing on the shoulders of giants. Before we get to the bloopers, a big thank you to this week's video sponsor, KiwiCo. KiwiCo delivers monthly science and art maker kits to your door to provide fun and learning for all ages. They have really hands-on projects designed to expose kids to different scientific concepts and are a great resource for learning at home. Each box comes with all the supplies you will need with detailed kid-friendly instructions. But really, these are perfect for kids of all ages, including big kids like us. I'm making their Light Up Planetarium Tinker Kit for ages nine plus, and Sam is making their Coin Sorting Eureka Kit for ages 14 plus, and they are so much fun. It was nice just to have a break from, you know, all that screen time time that comes with working from home at the minute, which I'm sure many kids are also noticing now it's back to virtual school time. I love their kits so much. Not only was it nice to have that final finished product, I feel like Simone Geertz, but the science content in the magazines they sent with it was extraordinary. Like, look at all this cool astronomy content. I would have loved this as a kid. So if that sounds good to all you little kids and big kids like us out there, then go to kiwico.com forward slash Dr. Becky. That's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y and you'll get 30% off your first month's kit. The link is in the description below. Thank you, Kiwico. You just made a lot of kids very, very happy. Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes. Not have pronounced it that way. Eratosthenes. 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 So the very first person that we know of anyway that tried to measure the size of the earth was Eratosthenes. 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 Eratosthenes fold it over so I can essentially make this little tower that my pencil or my pastel pink highlighter will supposedly balance the on. Ah! No! Why? Why are you being difficult? Ah! I'm difficult. I'm difficult. This is the one. This is the one. Yes! desk. Now my phone records at 120 frames per second in slow-mo mode. Slow-mo mode. Measuring the mass of the world, nah yeah, I don't know the radius. I don't know G and I don't know big G, but I'm gonna find it. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>